The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Exolix, a privacy-focused, non-custodial, instant crypto exchange. Go to exolix.com to enjoy secure and completely anonymous swaps with no KYC or sign-up. Swap between Monero and 2,000-plus assets at the most competitive rates and with no limits. Exolix.com, your fast and secure way to privacy. Hey, guys. Hey. What's going on, man? Hey. Oh, man, just chilling, you know, just listening to everything you guys got to say. Good start to the show this morning. Strong. If, nice, um, nice. if you guys... If y'all want to pivot to um, to the guest first, if he's got limited time, I mean, I can stick around and do the price report afterwards. Uh, I think we're I think we're good. I think we're good. Hold, let me. I think they're good. Okay. Cool. Um, wait, let me see. Let me just check my. Yeah, it's all good. Just go ahead. Okay, it's good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I see. I see. You got our our. This is when we made our guesses for price for Monerotopia. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, nice. right now I, I'm closest, but uh, with the way price is moving to the top side, maybe maybe you'll maybe we'll all be wrong. I hope we're all wrong. What did I put in? I put in. You, you put two hundred two. All right, all right, all right. You're the you're the orange line. We gave you the coveted burnt orange uh, color for for the chart here. We'll be flying high, man. The the tequila will be flowing. Yeah. <laughs> I actually don't really right. drink much tequila these days. But we'll Mezcal? definitely. See- uh, or mezcal. I haven't really, you know, I pretty much stopped drinking. Just purely, uh, purely a, a weed smoker these days. Um, okay. Yeah, stay stay away from the alcohol. But I mean, down down in Mexico, I'm sure I'll have a mezcal. You know, I've you, learned from you. Are are you are you complete straight edge? Well, well, you know, well, well, what's well, your? Well, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. I um, I went total straight edge from like October of last year until. Maybe like a couple months ago, um, you know, I was doing blood work. I'm always trying to like get stuff to be more ideal or like fix little things. And I was trying to solve something called um, high ferritin, which is like a high iron content. And I was trying to figure out if it was really high iron content or if it was some other problem. So like to try and like eliminate every cause, you know, systematically, I quit drinking for like six or nine months or something. Um, But no, I started, I started having, you know, like a few beers on the weekend. Did that, was that... Um, Fix your problem or no? No, no. I still had high ferritin. It, it turned out to be a high iron thing. I think it's like about ten percent of the population has like the natural propensity just to grab as much iron as it can and hang on to it. So you basically have to donate blood to get that down. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I have heard that. Yeah, I've never, I've never gone down the you know starting to just test my blood on a regular basis and you know look because that's just a rat. I mean, that could become a real time sink. Right. And then it's like, <laughs> and you don't really, it, there's always something. And I feel like psychologically it starts to psych you out a little bit. My, my, my thinking is what, no matter what my blood is saying or anything, I'm going to be doing ultimately the same things anyway to try to fix it. Right. Which is eat organic foods, right. Whole organic foods, meats, whatever good, pasture raised eggs things like that i'm gonna try to sleep my eight hours i'm gonna try to you know get get enough sunshine and try to exercise like no matter what my ailment is i'm gonna try to do the same things to fix it anyway that's i don't know is that that's that's my take and then that allows me to to not worry about the you know trying to whatever monitor my 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 body rather just focus on what the fixes are anyway which is oh it's 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 the same things we we you know there's there's no there's no super hidden secret right i don't know um i i that's kind of like the 80 percent solution like 100 percent yeah for it's the vast 80%. majority of people just doing those things is going to get you a really long way especially if you're say under 40 um you can basically just do that and, and have a pretty good result um the problem is that like there are there's these little things that everyone like that individuals have and they, they start to compound over time. Like, so for example, this high ferritin thing, this, this high iron content, you won't really notice it. It'll slowly creep up over time, especially if you're like me and you eat just like a shitload of red meat. Like I eat probably a kilogram of, of red meat every day. Um, you know, but since my body has, there's your iron. iron, (laughs) Well, the thing is like (laughs) your iron, like your body should be able to regulate that well, but about 10% of the population doesn't regulate that. You just hang on to as much iron as you can. 
So mm-hmm. if I test it and I know that my ferritin is like double what the, the, the maximum recommended, you know, level is, then I know like, oh, I know I need to go give blood. I need to get this iron content down. And I've actually, I've been able to see it in my blood work and my numbers as I've gotten that down. Um, it like high ferritin is correlated with all sorts of like all cause mortality. I mean, you're talking heart disease, cancer, insulin resistance, um, the full, the full gambit. Now I didn't have mm-hmm. like heart disease, insulin resistance, but you know, my fasting insulin levels were higher than I thought where they should be, you know, for, for a guy that's relatively healthy and works out and all that is like, wait, why is my insulin slightly high? It, it should be at the low end of the range. Um, you know, not, not, not a few points above. So anyways, I've been able to see all of that start to come back into range. Even things like your free testosterone can be affected Mm -hmm. by high ferritin. So just Mm -hmm. in general, my thinking is that as you start to approach 40, you really want to want to get a blood test at least once a year because there could be little things that you're not aware of. Maybe you're exposed to some environmental toxin that you weren't aware of. Maybe you have a high sensitivity to like one particular thing. Um, and you just, in a lot of cases, like you won't know unless you measure. So you don't want to psych yourself out about it, but I do think that it's valuable to, to get your blood work done. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't disagree with you there. It's just, yeah, it's, it's the same reason I don't follow the price charts. (laughs) You know, it's just like, (laughs) I just got my head down focus. Like, I don't think it would, yeah, I guess if I, if I saw some weird and I'll like, obviously if I had like high mercury, right. They'd be like, oh shit, but shouldn't eat as much freaking uh, tuna um for body tip he said dude don't worry about your high iron thing you live in Mex- mexico which is high altitude so your body needs the iron to get more oxygen all right it's interesting uh yeah i mean that's definitely take. a question about like hemoglobin for example right so you're mm-hmm. at high altitudes your body's going to want to have more hemoglobin to deliver more oxygen um yeah i mean when i say high iron i don't mean like i'm on the high end of the range i mean i'm like whoa ho- holy shit you're on the border of recommended to go see a specialist and it's and very interesting fix- so you said you did fix it though. So what were the tweaks you made to fix it? Well, I kind of did some experimentation, but the primary thing you can do is donate blood. Like for right. for the vast majority of people, if you donate blood two or three times a year, like anyone that has high ferritin, if you do two or three times a year, over the years, you'll come down, you'll get back into range, you'll be fine. Um, I was trying to experiment with sauna to see if I could lower it without donating blood. So like I donated blood a couple of times, my hemoglobin bounced back in a week, which is like a classic sign that you have a lot of iron. Um, and you know, my ferritin came down a little bit, right? It's like each blood donation is a little bit. So then I said, okay, cool. It is iron. I started doing a sauna to try and see if that would maybe like, if I could, if I could like get rid of the iron that way, because saunas, Mm -hmm. it's known for getting rid of heavy metal, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Um, yeah, that worked kind of for a while and then it stopped working. So now I'm kind of doing the blood donations again. I should be there in about a month or two. You're, You're, you're really, you're not supposed to donate you know, more than once every like six to eight weeks. But for people yes. that have <laughs> ferritin content at my level, they will actually prescribe phlebotomy like once a week or once every two weeks until you get down to where you should be. Really? So yeah, you just have to monitor you, your hemoglobin. You're, you're meant to be, you know, like a freaking warrior out there fighting every day. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's in my <laughs> blood. Maybe I need to go bleed some more. I don't know. You got to go like, like wrestle animals and try to kill them with your bare hands and then eat them. Like you're, that's the problem. You're just eating the steak. You're not, you know, you're not wrangling, uh, wrestling a, a wolf. I think that is kind <laughs> of my thinking. You're not like, spilling enough an blood, man. You know, it could be, it really could be an adaptation for immediate term survival, midterm survival. Oh shit. I just, you know, on a hunt or, you know, I just lost a shitload of blood. Good thing I have high iron content. I yeah. can replace that hemoglobin quickly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in terms of longevity, in terms of uh, staying young and healthy and, you know, into your 60s, 70s and 80s, well, it's, it's not the best, it's not the best thing. Shit. That's yeah, a most good people point. have, most people have little <laughs> things like that. Like there's this yeah, idea yeah. that everyone has like four or five different genetic mutations that are low level in the population, you know, like one to 10% of the population. But the specific mm. ones that you have mean that you should maybe be supplement. You should maybe be avoiding particular things, or you should maybe be supplementing in particular ways that most people wouldn't need to. And so, if you can figure this out over time, then then you can actually extend your lifespan, extend your health span. I would like to add some like health element to Monerotopia, like maybe like a workshop or something. I don't know who who would be good to try to get to run something where Me. people can walk away. Uh, yeah, frankly. would you be down? <laughs> yeah. You'd be down to do that? Yeah, yeah, I'd give a health workshop. Bro, oh, I've been doing like awesome. I've been experimenting with diet and health since like 2008. So I mean, I'm not No, a I know, and you, anything, you, but... you know your shit, man. I know you know you're yeah. Any anything you focus on. Uh, he wait, has we got, the we got IQ another... to back it up. 
Yeah, <laughs> and, and we got oh, we got another tip here. Labia tipped uh, Labia tipped uh, fifty cents. Uh, when will the calendar schedule be available? So I don't know. I mean, it's it's four days of nonstop talks and workshops. We'll get it up soon. It's just we got a lot to juggle juggle here. We'll start we'll start putting something up, and then it'll be subject to change. Um, but yeah, make all make all four of your days available to be hanging out at Monerotopia. And then the, the, the hackathon, we'll get into that once Chill gets up here with Devrick. But we're, we're thinking, you know, that might even be, we might even start that a day or two earlier so people can start, you know, getting their projects going. But, buddy, uh, take it away, man. Take it away. Yeah, let's get into the price. Price has been, well, I mean, we're kind of, as we always say, we're stable coins. So, been pretty stable, but price has been moving to the upside for the past, like, last week. Obviously, the big news is that um, Jay Powell reduced rates by 50%. We expected this. He said in Jackson Hole last month that, that this was going to happen. Um, so it's completely unsurprising. Um, but it is, like, in me, for, in my mind, that's kind of like, that, that's like the last thing that I wanted to see that was like, hey, this is the confirmation that we are probably looking at some kind of, like, crash coming up here soon. Um, we'll get on, we'll get into the macro stuff later, but um, yeah, for now we've got our, our Monero chart here. We are actually trying to bump towards the top side here. Let's drop a couple lines. So right here, right our local high, we're getting pretty close to that, right? We're 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 just starting to approach that. With the way that Monero's price likes to take its sweet time when it makes movements, it it really wouldn't be surprising to touch that line, maybe even bounce above it. Uh, you know, do something like that. You know, that that kind of thing could happen. Um, in, in a lot of ways. You know, we, we've talked about the Bitcoin price and we, we've talked about how there's, you know, at this point, the Bitcoin price really needed a lot of consolidation and, and to expect it to just sort of ride this trend here, right, to, to, to stay in this area. Um, so if we kind of take the correlation of Monero and Bitcoin's price as sort of a proxy for what Monero might do, I'm just saying that it wouldn't be totally surprising if we're not quite at the moment where things are ready to break out to the top side, right? Maybe we need a little bit more sideways consolidation. Hey, who knows? Maybe right around Monerotopia is when the price shoots up. That could happen. That would be cool. Um, we have seen the transaction counts bump up significantly, if I can find them. There we go. Yeah, so uh, Monero transaction counts just moved up from like 20K to above 30K. It's like we just added 10,000 transactions uh, per day, which is cool. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that's going on, but it's probably not any kind of attack. It's probably just organic. If it was an attack, we would we would probably see something like you know what we saw here um previously where things just like spiked up so um yeah it just seems like i guess people are getting the message right they're watching more Monerotopia. smash the like by the way um and uh and they're just realizing hey why don't i just use monero why am i going to do all of this uh privacy gymnastics on bitcoin when i can just use monero and um and i think you know ultimately that's going to have an effect on the price as people use it um it, it's just as simple as that when something is used you end up with a, a larger amount of like even if you just wanted to use Monero to for a transaction, but you're like a Bitcoiner, or maybe you're an, a meth head, uh, an Ethereum maximalist, right? If you but you're like, oh, I need a private transaction, I got to buy some Bibles on the dark web in China. You might, um, you, you know, you're going to have some amount of currency for the time period that stays in Monero, right? That value is going to be in Monero at least for a short time period. So as more people use it, as we get more transactions that implies a larger amount of funds staying in Monero, a larger amount of value just staying natively in Monero in aggregate over the total population, which implies price increases. Now, we have, you know, in sort of like this reverse reaction to the Bitcoin maximalism, just hodl, bro. Uh, we've kind of had this reverse reaction of like, don't buy Monero for investment, don't buy Monero for price. Um, you know, and that's that's a good kind of reaction. It's like... Uh, you know, it's it's the metaphorical truth that that we're using to to try and keep as a bulwark against that kind of mentality of you know the degen mentality of oh, just number go up, BlackRock buy my bags. Um, but it would be better it would be better if Monero had a higher price because it would encourage um, a higher hash rate. So let's just take a look at the average uh, hashes per day here on Monero. And um, oh wow, we're actually doing really good. That's awesome. Okay, so yeah, we've there was there was like some. Um, a lot of this volatility you see here in in uh, in this area um, was apparently some big botnet got shut down, but then we recovered like very very quickly, and and now like hash rate is up here. Probably this is related correlated to Monero's price doing relatively well over the past few months, right? Hash rate is is doing good. Monero's price is encouraging more people to hash, and so the higher that Monero's price goes, the higher that our hash rate is going to go because it just makes that economic calculation a lot easier. 
So I say the biggest reason that we want a higher price is to encourage more hash rate. We can still get attacked. Like I don't like the, the fact that we could still get attacked. Um, it would be, I mean, you need a lot of resources. You're gonna have to marshal a lot of CPUs from, I don't know, probably the government would do it and <laughs> they'd probably go to Amazon or Microsoft or people that run big CPU, you know, big server farms, or whatever. Um, yeah, they would need to do that. So it would be like annoying for them, but they could totally do it. Um, so that, that is a problem. But if we like 10x the hash rate, you know, like obviously we'd all be millionaires by the time we have 10x the price. Um, but that would put us like significantly farther away from making it easy for any government or large resource entity to actually attack us, right? That makes it much less likely. So the reason we want to see price increases increases is to see the hash increase. Uh, and hash rate increase is not just security theater in Monero because we have CPU mining. Okay, we're, this is a price show, so you know, I kind of like kind of gone off on my like little rant there. So, uh, okay, but anyway, so here's the price. Monero is doing good. Like I said, might need some more consolidation before we actually start to move to the upside. Um, that would be corroborated by um, what's happening with like the Bitcoin price. Um, uh, Monero versus Bitcoin is also doing quite well. We've taken a bit of a cool off since we last talked a couple weeks ago. Um, basically just trying to get back into those lower standard deviation bands that all broke down from the delisting. Uh, although we are now solidly in the long-term lower standard deviation bands, which are that yellow line uh, that I drew there. So we're basically like hanging out around that area. Um, again, that's very long-term lines. Like if we go to the, the weekly here, you'll be able to see that a little bit more clearly. Um, obviously we still need a lot more recovery here. Uh, this is the kind of thing that's just barely maybe starting to show some some slowdown here, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, let's make sure and check the comments here. I always like to make sure we got the comments. Yeah, okay, nothing nothing price related, I don't think. The huge dip was the Stripe Miner stop mining. Ah, okay. Uh, I guess it was called the Stripe Miner. Uh, that was with that was regard to the uh, the Monero hash rate when we when we lost the the botnet. Um, Okay, so then uh, we also have Monero versus Ethereum, which has also taken a little bit of a cooldown. Um, stopped out at the the kind of very obvious place here with the with the the moving average cluster. So maybe need some more consolidation there. ETH has not been performing very well, not relative to Bitcoin, not relative to Monero. Um, so maybe we've got some extra gains to to go there in relative to ETH. Same thing with the uh, XMR dominance. Obviously, it's basically just how Monero is doing relative to Bitcoin and ETH plus all the shit coins, but there's really not much to say there. Um, you know, I don't know. One thing I need to figure, I need to um, check is whether total two and total three include stable coins or not, because that's kind of like, in some ways it's like you shouldn't include stable coins. In other ways, it's kind of like you should, you know, like, like the USDT has taken the currency use case from Bitcoin, like across the world. It doesn't matter if it's Latin America or Russia, people are using tether. Right. And that's, that's not, that, that just gives power to fiat and to the dollar. So it's inexcusable for all the maximalists for all these years that have tried to say that Tether is good in a way like it serves a function. And I guess I use it too sometimes, but it's it's, it's an unfortunate reality when when we were supposed to have scalability. Uh, at least if we had scalability on Bitcoin, I could be like, all right, whatever, you know, at least it's scalable. But there's not even that, like no privacy and not even scalable. All right. Anyways, enough trashing Bitcoin. Uh, Xano. Xano is, uh, has had some big gains, as we saw for the past couple of weeks. It's really just consolidating at these levels. Um, yeah, it looks like the, that, that's a big appetite. You know what I mean? You've gone, you've gone three X, um, it, you know, it, it might be hard to find new buyers in the short immediate term, but consolidation here and uh, a positive crypto market probably spells more gains for Xano in the long term. Um, I don't know what it's going to do in the short term, but looks to me like it's consolidating. I can't tell you if that's a top or bottom or whatever that is. Firo is actually convincing me now that it might be in a bottoming pattern. Um, it's done enough chop, chop down here at these levels to make me think, Hey, actually it, it seems to be establishing these lower standard deviation bands. I don't know how well you guys can see that. Let's zoom in. Uh, yeah. So this, these band clusters down here, those lower standard deviation band clusters. So we had like this oscillation, you would almost call this like a, a W, a W bottom, but maybe it's like a double W bottoming pattern, which is something I just made up. Uh, but anyways, yeah, Firo might be able to convince me here that it's that it's actually bottoming. You might you might look to to acquire a little bit on on dips here and and see if you can't get something make some of that work for you. I wouldn't put any significant amount of money there. Pirate chain doing nothing, just kind of flat. Looks like it's flatlined for a little bit here. Although we say flatline, but I mean this thing is actually moving up. Um, you know, twenty percent from these uh, from these oscillations. So. Um, I don't know if you, if it, if it had liquidity and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I wouldn't expect that it does, but if it has liquidity, um, these wicks and these oscillations, you could you could probably 
I mean, you know, that's a lot of noise here. You could probably use that in some kind of trading strategy, but I don't know how far you could get with it if they don't have liquidity. Maybe they do. I've never checked it, but it's an idea if you're a DJ and you just want to like try and take advantage of of, um, of the volatility happening there. Um, Darrow, Darrow's trying to make a comeback slowly, slowly. It's not really doing much, although, I mean, it's up like 50% from the bottom. So um, this might be a bottoming pattern as well. Uh, I, I would figure anyone that wanted to sell Darrow is probably mostly already sold by now, right? Like, like probably most people have already have already panic dumped. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they'll fix their chain, or maybe they already have. <laughs> I just don't care. Like, I don't care about Darrow. Like, I never thought they would be anything good, anyways. Like, they just did dumb things. Like, when you release, when you release bulletproofs before the math audit is done, that's irresponsible. It's fucking irresponsible, and. I don't need to. I don't need to review the cryptography. I, I, if I know that, then I know not to not to actually invest in that project as like a, a real long term thing. Um, it would just be like a price thing. So um, yeah, okay. Uh, we got Kevin here. He says that one hundred and seventy seven dollars looks like an interesting price point for Monero. Win moon. Um, we will moon on February. Let's just say February. Uh, let's say Valentine's Day on February fourteenth. Right um, there, you go, sweetheart. Okay. So Zcash, Zcash, Zcash. Yeah. Okay. So we have Zcash here. Um, they also are kind of like consolidating after some pretty big movements. It's funny how they fell so much from the top that it's like, doesn't matter that they did like <laughs> two and a half X. It, that, that doesn't look like much in comparison to how far they fell, but okay, let's zoom in and we can actually get a better, uh, a better feel for that. So yeah, I mean, there was the big dump, you know, and now it's kind of like consolidating here. Okay. I don't know. Whatever Zcash. Um, I don't have any opinions really on where that goes. Uh, okay, so yeah, we, we let's go to Bitcoin. We talked about Bitcoin. We just like to have this kind of consolidation happening here. Um, I think that this is likely to continue. Um, the, it could be the case that there's more gains on the way. The Fed just lowered rates, but I feel like I mean there are more gains on the way. It just could you know it could take longer than than we would than we would hope, right? Um, let's take a look at the wave magic on this one. The, the wave magic actually spells a very similar picture. Um, when we look at the the blue bands, right, the clusters of upper standard deviations. So effectively, these blue bands here are just kind of like compressing, right? They're getting more and more narrow. And I would imagine that uh, in steady state conditions, right, absent some broader market crash, you could basically just expect Bitcoin to, to continue ranging in these bands for some period of time. Eventually, it will break to the upside. That will probably be concurrent with some new liquidity expansion. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about the liquidity expansion later. I have a lot of ideas on that. Um, someone asked earlier about Ethereum versus Bitcoin. I got to be honest, guys, this is a missed call on my part, and it makes me sad because I hate, hate, hate missing calls. Um, I really did think that the ETF was going to push a little bit more funds into Ethereum, um, but relative to Bitcoin, it just hasn't mattered, right? It's down like, from that moment, it's down like 30% now. And this chart, like, it just doesn't look like a good chart. Like, as much as I would like to, to, to think this chart's going to come back to the upside, um, I mean, it broke down the obvious pattern. It broke down the the falling wedge. Um, and like, honestly, this chart could could reasonably fall all the way to these lower standard deviations, like especially if we get a tail risk event, right? And I think that's a reasonable possibility. Like we could get some kind of big market crash. Maybe it tries to like come back and then we get a market crash and actually hits that spot. I still think that Ethereum is going to outperform Bitcoin. It's going to get back to these levels at least. Um, I think it's, I used to think that it's, let me rephrase this. I still think it's very possible that Ethereum gains market cap parity with Bitcoin. However, Solana has stolen a significant amount of the degeneracy um, from, from Ethereum, right? Ethereum was like the degen chain where you can get all the ERC-20 tokens and do all this cool shit. Um, but then like, but then Solana came along and, and just stole a lot of that thunder, right? The, the memes are on Solana now. People are like doing the Solana degeneracy. So I think Ethereum has lost a lot of its, a lot of its price potential to Solana. Um, you know, and that's a big miss on my part, real, realistically speaking. Um, that's that's actually something that was pretty predictable in, in hindsight, um, but it could have been predictable without hindsight. Like you could have used foresight to say, you know what, Solana was a big, a big player. You can see all the meme degeneracy is developing there. They've got all the stuff going on. Um, and that, yeah, and to know that that's going to steal some of Ethereum's market cap. So, um, yeah, you know, I missed that one. Uh, but what a, whatever, what are you going to do, right? You're going to miss some of them. Uh, let's take a look at the Z scores. So XMR is actually performing relatively better um, over the past, uh, let's just say like three weeks here. And a lot of that was was generated by when the crypto market was going down, Monero was holding steady. And so we had we had pretty good relative price performance overall while the rest of the crypto market was was languishing. They're starting to catch up now, but Monero is, is actually, you know, keeping up at the moment. So 
Um, yeah, relatively speaking, Monero's done good. Um, who are the big winners lately? I guess AVAX did pretty good and BNB. Okay. And Dogcoin. All right. Our favorite. Is it Dog? No, no, no. No, no. Sorry. Bitcoin. They're actually all doing pretty good. Um, we're not going to dwell too long on that. But uh, yeah, so Monero, Monero currently top performer over the past few weeks. Um, okay, now let's go to the macro stuff. We'll start with gold because I'm sure that watching this gold chart is making a lot of people happy. Um, let's drop down here to the daily where we can see how good gold has done lately. Um, effectively, you know, we broke out of this wedge. We're kind of like approaching this other wedge here. So this spot, this spot right there is a very interesting spot. We'll go to the monthly so that you can see why. Effectively, that is a um, that's a that's a resistance line that we draw from going all the way back to 1980, if you can believe it, right? So this line right here, um, we just connect the two tops from 1980 and then 2011, right? These are big macro blow off tops. Um, and we're effectively touching that. And you can see that this is a big macro rising wedge on the order of four decades, 40 years, guys. It is, this, this chart pattern has been in the making. Um, so are we gonna break it immediately right now? Pro probably not. It's difficult to think that gold is just gonna smash to the upside break all these resistances without respecting them in the slightest. Um, you know, here's, here's a slight side note. When it comes to resistances and strong points on the chart that you're like, hey, that's a spot that everyone's going to look at and say that's strong resistance, could be the previous all-time high, whatever. Whenever you break a very strong resistance without respecting it, you just smash through it like it wasn't there. Very often is the case on the way down, you'll bust through that resistance without respecting it either. So, when you when you hit resistance, it's a good thing to see a pause, to see some pullback, to see a little bit of um, well resistance at that spot. You want to see that because it establishes that as a new place, right? People take their profits, um, all the traders, you know, they're doing all their thing, and eventually the market's going to resettle and determine, like, decide, okay, well, we are ready to go up now, and then it'll go up. So that on the way back down, um, if there is a way back down, sometimes there's not, many times there's not. But it, on the way back down, you'll respect that resistance because it was previous resistance. Again, a lot of this is psychological. Um, but yeah, so we're basically we're basically zooming back here into the daily. We're, we're hitting, we're very, very close to these resi resistance levels. And this was a spot that I was, remember I was saying, hey, this wouldn't be a bad spot to take some profit. It wouldn't, <clears throat> it wouldn't be so much taking profit as it would be like, I'm going to pivot um, some of these gains into some other type of asset, right? So Maybe, maybe it's real estate. They're lowering rates. So now people are going to want to start buying houses again, right? Maybe that the, the, the stockpile, the buildup of all the houses that are on the market, maybe those start moving. Um, perhaps this, this generates positive movement uh, in, in housing prices. That could happen, right? So you might, you might actually use that to put a down payment on a house or something like that. That, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be bad money management overall, right? When you have big gains and it's a growing percentage of your stack, you typically reallocate that to some other like part of your life that um that's important to you. So at any rate, I'm not saying that this thing is not going to go to the top side. In fact, if it is, it, it could very well break. Like we could actually see it break this with a wick to the top side and then come back down. Um, I don't know what the timing on that looks like. Um, so I actually I do kind of want to start theorizing on, on some of the timing here. So as we talked about, the, the Fed started lowering rates. Let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? Uh, okay, yeah, so we've got the Fed is now lowering rates. You, you can see this white line right here. That was that was them dropping rates. Half a percent. You can see that the bond market already knew that the Fed was dropping rates because the bond market has already been going to the downside. Oh, by the way, look at the inversion. We are already, at, <clears throat> at least in part of the way that we measure this, the yield curve is already not inverted partially. The red line still kind of needs to get above this to, to sort of confirm. But overall, like this is the pattern we've talked about for months, really, for, for years, actually. Um, we're looking for this thing to spike violently to the upside as the Fed continues to lower rates and bonds start to crash towards the downside. Um, that's one of the big signs that, that a crash is imminent. Um, let's take a little bit of a closer look at that. Um, so what we have here is the S&P 500 in the candles, and then the federal funds rate is in white. And I wanted to look at this because we you want to be able to say how long after the Fed starts lowering rates could it be until the market shows us some kind of big crash? Um, so let's go back here to the cove, the, the crash of, of, of 2020. Um, I almost said it. I almost said the prohibited word. I almost got us banned. Okay, so one thing you'll notice is that um, the Fed started lowering rates right here, and then the market actually continued going up. It, it took a while, right? That was like... I don't know how many days that would be. It looks like to me about uh, maybe like 70 days. 
or like 60 days. It took a month or so before the market actually like made new all time highs. And then the thing just continued marching higher until uh, until that thing happened at the end of February, beginning of March. And then the market just crashed. Overall, that was 140 days from when the Fed started lowering rates till we actually hit a real market crash. Um, so, OK, 140 days. We'll keep that in our mind. Um, if we go back here to 2008, uh, 2008 was a little bit different. It's 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 like it's kind of arbitrary. Where do you want to say, OK, the market crashed, quote unquote. Um, but the Fed started lowering rates right here, which is, you know, we can see that's where we drew that line. In the case of, of 2008, what I did instead was um, I said, OK, uh, we actually made another all time high, which is what happened in, in uh, 2019, 2020. There was another all time high made. Um, and then things came down. Instead, what I did here is I, I, I said, okay, where did we fall out of trend, right? You kind of had this like support line here and we fell out of trend um, about 100, 108 days later. We, we could, maybe that's a little bit too far, but we could say, let's just say 100 days, right? Um, you'll notice right here, like there's a few extra days unaccounted for. I don't feel like changing it right now. Anyway, so about 100 days, right? So 100 days, 140 days. And then the dot-com is actually even harder. Um, and again, the, we're, we're seeing this change um, because markets learn, right? Markets are learning that when the Fed lowers rates, a crash could be coming. Um, so in the case of, of the dot-com bust, uh, markets had topped long before, right? And then they started moving towards the downside. The big crash started in earnest around March of, um, of 2001. So you can see that right there. So from the moment that the Fed started lowering rates to where things really like crashed in earnest, you know, kind of really breaking out of like this, this support area, uh, was about 50 days um, after the Fed started lowering rates. But again, the market had already kind of been on its way down. So, all right. I know that was a little bit cumbersome to go through, but I just wanted to show you guys. So we're looking at like, you know, 50 days, 100 days, 150 days. So hypothetically, um, if we're looking, we, we could be looking anywhere from, let's just drop the uh, drop the measurement here. If it was 50 days, we would be looking at perhaps December. Um, if it was 150 days, we would be looking at perhaps April. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the markets could continue to go up here. I'm not telling you that that the crash is here. I'm just saying, like, that was the last confirmation piece in my mind that the snowball is happening. Um, there are events in motion that cannot be undone. Um, and things are like we're probably going to see some kind of market crash. So, um, yeah, that's 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 like the j -Pow macro stuff. Um, the S&P 500 actually put on um, new all time highs this past week um, just by a tiny little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the S&P made new all-time highs. The NASDAQ is still kind of languishing, which is interesting um, because of all the AI stuff and all the tech stuff. You would think the NASDAQ would be performing better. I don't know why it's not, but it still hasn't made new all-time highs. Eh, it's only 5% off all-time highs, though. So that's the NASDAQ. Um, okay, reverse repos are just steady, but they seem to like have entered a downtrend now. So this seems to be, if this downtrend continues, this would seem to be fuel for the markets to continue going up for the meantime. But um you know they're running out. They're running out of uh, liquidity here from the reverse repos to use. So you know they we, we could see this thing come to the downside, and once it hits zero, like there's no more money to pull from reverse repos and drop into uh, and drop into the market. So um, the other thing too is that if we do have a market crash coming, people like to get into bonds. The safety of bonds um, that's a, that's a common thing that happens. Uh, we also talked about oil. We we had not looked at oil for a long time, and I started looking at it again um, because we're we sort of dropped out of trend here. You'll notice and. This is not a confirmed, in my mind, this isn't exactly a confirmed falling out of trend. Um, it could be the case that this just wanted to visit this area right here because of the, the horizontal significance. Um, so hypothetically, maybe things could do that, which would signal really more time before we have any kind of crash. Um, but if this thing starts to move towards the downside and we get a downtrend, that's really telling you, hey, the, there's a, the crash is, is starting to think sooner rather than later. Um, so we'll keep, we'll keep looking at that, um, as the weeks go by. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I want to throw out one little like crackpot theory here about how we could see a crash unfold guys. It, as you know, I just, I, I see Coke and Pepsi when I look at Kamala and, and Trump, maybe, maybe, maybe Trump is more like a useful idiot that like believes his own authority and then like woke up kind of like Musk was like, Oh wow, it looks like they're censoring people. You know, and like, oh, uh, it seems like the government might be nefarious. So maybe that happened with Trump and, and all the stuff, you know, the medical stuff from 2020. Who knows, right? But ne nevertheless, I still see it as like this Coke versus Pepsi thing. I, I don't, I don't think that necessarily, you know, it, it's like there's two sides of this of this agenda. You've got the commie side of the agenda, which the Democrats love to occupy. They just love being commies, socialists, whatever. 
you know, but then Trump, Musk, Peter Thiel, you have to look at the connections these guys all have, right? I mean, we're talking like Bilderberg. They are the, you know, Trump was the money printer extraordinaire of 2020 and caused the inflation, even though he blames Biden. These guys are the technocratic corporatist side of the deep state. Um, there's all, they're also the bordertarian side of the deep state. We need to lock down the borders. It's like, well, the borders are already locked down. The terrorist government is importing terrorists so that they can disrupt society. That's really the problem. It's, it's not a question about the borders as much as it is about importing terrorists intentionally. But um, you know, the, the right, the Republicans occupy this like bordertarian side to, to beef up the military so that they can oppress you better. They can get all their robot dogs. I don't know if you've seen those guys, but those robot dogs walking around um, have actually been used in America now um, to bust in doors and stuff. So it's like, okay, you've got the two sides of the technocracy of the deep state of of the of the lockdown people, uh, and they're both just doing different things, right? So the, the the side on the right beefs up the military, does the border, uh, and then advances the technocratic uh, agenda. So why do I say all that? Because if there's some kind of crash coming, and I think that, that there is, it would make a lot of sense in this polar, polarized environment that Kamala as a lame duck, if she, and because I think, why would they do the assassinations if Trump wasn't meant to get elected and do some stuff in office? Um, the, 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 the theatrical events, there's two of them now. <laughs> um, so it would be very, very useful, I think, for the technocratic deep state to have Kamala do some of the things that Trump absolutely couldn't do because they'd be unpopular. Maybe she'd do them in like December as a lame duck or late November, maybe like the first days of January. And then Trump would come in and say, oh, my God, what a terrible mismanagement of this whole crisis. Uh, it's just terrible. We're going to we're going to change this and do all the good stuff. Right. But he's just going to do the other side of that technocratic deep state. So you get the commie implementation emergency measures from Kamala and then you get the technocratic implementations from Trump and you get like everything that you wanted. Right. So I look at that and I think to myself, wouldn't it be convenient if there was a December crisis crash? Right. Because um, they're going to need an excuse to do the liquidity expansion. So. I am starting to narrow down my time scale here um, to something between, let's just say, November and March. My thinking is between November and March would be perfect timing for, um, for the next major false flag crisis. Could be cyber attack, could be whatever. Keep in mind, yo, that is my like completely uh, like unhinged <laughs> ranting ideas, you know, trying to sort of like synthesize from a nebula. I'm cloud watching from like this nebulous cloud of what could be going on, looking at a bunch of squiggles on charts and then like thinking about the macro stuff. Like, I just want to let you guys know, like, obviously that's, that's kind of, um, that's crackpot speculation, but in my personal mind, that's where I'm looking at. Now let's take a look at this in terms of like, what can you do if there's a big crash coming? And, and the Fed is like, we're going to start expanding the balance sheet again, and we're going to rescue the market. We're dropping rates you know, to 2% or back to zero or whatever. Um, this is not financial advice, and I actually do have to say that here, but an idea that you could do is to take out something like a home equity loan, max out your credit cards, whatever. Like, however, it, whatever you need to do to get access to money. And, and it, like, if I was 20 something and I was looking, you know, like say 21, and I was looking to just like absolutely YOLO at an early point in my life, I would 100% do this. I would take as much credit as I could in any crash event. And the moment that Jay Power, whoever says they're gonna intervene and rescue the market, I am maximizing every loan I can possibly get and dropping it into cryptocurrency. Um, that's like, that, that could just be a massive windfall for you. Like it's basically, it is near zero risk. When the Fed says we're gonna intervene in this market crash, that is a near zero risk moment. And that is what the entire financial bro sector does. They, they take leveraged loans, they print new money, because <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're printing new money, they all do it. And the market has to go up. It's like math, like the, the market mathematically must go up when that happens. So think about it ahead of time. Say, hey, how am I going to get access to capital to liquidity? How am I going to take loans? How am I going to print my own money and invest that into high risk assets that can yield me, you know, two, three, four, five, 10x. Um, and then obviously pay those loans back and in that case, you actually might, you know what, we won't talk about this. Uh, forget that last part. Just, just figure out ahead of time how you would take loans and, um, and then maximize your opportunity there at the bottom, especially if you're young and you have a high risk tolerance. If you're 50, 60, and you got your life savings already and you got your houses, maybe that's not the best idea. Maybe you take a smaller loan, right? You got to take less risk. Okay, <laughs> that's the price report today. Let me check these YouTube comments. I see we've got Roy here. NASDAQ, a giant casino. It is a casino. Um, the funny thing is, uh, the, the house is rigged. The, the game is rigged to go up. It's always up. So it's, they're like, it's a casino. They want you in, which is kind of a trap, which all casinos kind of are. 
Um, let's see. I kept a bit of powder when the financial system will collapse to get cheaper XMR. Yeah, 100%. Uh, oh, the Simpsons told us that Kamala will be the next president. Okay. Uh, thanks, did you get Did you get some of the um, super chats up top? Did you get those? I got earlier. I got Kevin. Yeah. Um, no, there was this oh, guy. Oh, you know here. what? I missed. I missed crack purchase scene yeah. enthusiast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, crack purchase scene enthusiast. Bowdy is engineered to spill blood both on the battlefield and the markets. Your call on gold and XMR for the last three months are dead on. Closest Bowdy fanboy. Oh, thank you, AK Anon. Appreciate that, bro. <laughs> And then, right, I don't know if you got if you got this one too. Oh, you got Kev. Kev tipped twenty five cents. One seventy seven looks interesting price point for Monero when Moon. Yeah, you got that one. All right, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more with the Coke Pepsi. That's always how I that's how I explain it to my child. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's, a, a, it's a it's a clever yeah. it's a not so clever trick that that America keeps falling for. The surveillance state wins in the end Coke and they're the ones that keep gaining ground why we lose it all right man um anything else no that's enough ranting for one day okay no fantastic that was great thanks body thank you so much man fantastic job as always 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 the best takes